So thank you everyone um, for joining us in that brief period of worship. And I'm really excited that we're gathered here today to talk about the, um, the next steps in how we gather as a people. Um, so just some history in, uh, in the fall of 2020, we had a gathering of a couple of gatherings of leaders of monthly meetings and quarterly meetings, which is um, intended to be sort of a regular check in among those people. And um, the obviously the pandemic was a big topic. Um, so we had a follow up to those meetings via email and survey um, where we asked uh, individuals at monthly meetings and quarterly meetings to let us know who in their meetings they thought had experience in the work of putting on virtual meetings or hybrid meetings. Um, the idea that we can meet in person and also find ways in that process to um, include people who are joining virtually. Um, so this notion of hybrid meetings was born. And we got a few people um, and we reached out to those folks um, who I think are among this group gathered today and also gave it a, more of an open invitation. Um, and here we are. Um, I think word has spread steadily throughout the um, days leading up to this that, some, that this um, consultation was happening and we'll see where we go. I think it was originally intended to be uh, something more preliminary um, and, and I think it's become something else. The spirit has been moving among us. Um, we think we're all very interested and I feel heartened by that. Um, I really love the idea of finding ways to increase the accessibility of, of our gatherings when we come together in whatever way, locally or regionally. Um, so this is exciting to me. And we've invited some special guests, um, including Molly and Susan, who I will let you all introduce yourselves and just turn it over to you right now, Molly. Hey, can everyone hear me all right? I'm Molly Bryan from Third Haven in Easton, Maryland, and I see my friend John Turner is here today as well as part of our tech team. So uh, what I wanted to do, if it's okay, is just kind of walk you through the steps of our hybrid meeting as we started pretty early trying to put it together. And hopefully some of the things that worked for us and some of our pitfalls may be helpful to you. I'm not going to cover the tech aspect a whole lot because Susan is going to go into that. Um, but I wanted to say, you know, we started on Zoom very early in the pandemic in March, and we were all virtual until some of the restrictions list lifted in May. And as a first step for hybrid meetings, we called an all clerks meeting to get the sense of the group, what people's needs were, and start getting more and more people active with a hybrid meeting, specifically our pastoral care and our worship and ministry. We decided early on that it was important to us to keep our community together. So having separate meetings because we're a small meeting uh, didn't sound like it was gonna work for us. We wanted community and that was our priority. So we had pastoral care um, call and get in touch with, with everybody. First to check their level of comfort, either staying virtual or being in person. Um, then see kind of what people's needs were. 
then we got worship and ministry involved in trying to do a setup with us on the grounds and person meetings that would allow us to emulate our own worship service as much as possible. This was very important to us because we were first setting up in the summertime on the grounds. And we wanted people to have that sense of the sacred when they were, when they were outside, uh, specifically have greeters, have um, safety measures put up, go over the rules with everyone, and make sure that when people entered the space where we were worshiping, that there was that sense of the sacred, they entered silently. The next step we did is we had, I had wonderful support from people like John and Dee Ryan um, on, they were interested in developing this, this technology and integrating it together. So we put in some hours with our caretaker. Our caretaker has a sideline job at, in a rock and roll band. And that helps out a lot. <laughs> he had a soundboard, he had microphone, and he, he had equipment that we could set up on the ground to make the sound integrated with our laptop. Um, we were able to set up a microphone in front of our Zoom camera, which we had on a tripod. And we asked people if they wanted to give vocal ministry to come and stand six feet away from the microphone then they could take their mask off, give their vocal ministry and reset down. Uh, that seemed to work quite well. Um, people on Zoom were able to hear very well and people on the grounds could hear through the microphone. The one big thing with hybrid meetings that we had to go through every single time was making sure that people on the grounds did not have their phones on Zoom at the same time with their audio on because you get an automatic reverb if you're using a microphone. So setting up uh, enough time every week to do a quick sound check was, was really important to us since it, with the equipment we were using, we wanted to be sure that people on Zoom heard the people on the grounds and people on the grounds heard people on Zoom without a lot of reverb or echo. I think the next thing that we kind of went through is how do we do hospitality when we have a hybrid meeting? And we went through several combinations of things to do for that. And we actually ended up developing what we call the phone on the stick, <laughs> which is an unusual thing when you're meeting outside. And we've since transformed that a little bit. But early in the pandemic, when we were doing a hybrid meeting, when we finished our meeting for worship, we first went to the Zoom people and we walked around the room to do a check-in with everybody. That allowed the people that were there in person to actually hear everyone's voice, see everyone's picture because you can do the speaker view on that and have a connection with the people that were virtual. Then we cut the sound off on the um, iPad laptop we were using for Zoom and put an iPhone with audio actually on a stick. And we walked around to everyone that was there in person so they could greet, talk, and the people on Zoom could see them as though they were a Zoom face. This worked quite well. And of course, early in the pandemic, when you're meeting outside, you have a lot of ambient noise if you're planning on meeting outside in the coming months, you are gonna to have to deal with some of those sound issues, but that worked quite effectively. Again, our number one goal was to keep people in community. And in order to do that, we had to tweak this, the sound system quite a bit in order to, to, to have everybody that was on Zoom see everybody that was live as well. Now, we did open up our old meeting house in late September, October. This is a picture of our old meeting house in the spring. Some of you, of course, have been there and it's, it really is quite lovely. But we were able to open that up because it has a lot of windows and a lot of ventilation. And since we've done that and opened up hybrid meetings in there, one of our craftsmen has made a wooden iPad stand for my large iPad 
same varnish as the old meeting house. It's very unobtrusive. And inside the meeting house, we have not had to use excessive microphones. Our biggest problem, and I'm hoping to get some input from Susan with this, is to get um, pictures of everybody that is inside the meeting house because the configuration in the meeting house is a little bit difficult with that. Um, and, and really last, before my time ends up, is um, I, the unexpected positive in having a hybrid meeting is the closeness that you develop together with your tech team, with people working together with a common goal in mind to keep our communities together and to reach out for those that need us. You have an intimacy with those other people that we haven't had before. And it, it's truly remarkable. I think in last week's meeting for, for worship, one person on Zoom said how wonderful it was to see people's faces closer and to develop that relationship a little bit better. And we've had a lot of technical glitches. We, we were part of that, um, if everybody remembers the Sunday on Zoom where everything went down on Zoom <laughs> and everyone across the country struggled. Well, you just pick yourself up by your bootstraps and you laugh about it and you have a good time because those things are going to happen and um, it's all part of it. Uh, learning and growing together. And really quickly, John, have I left out anything? Well, the next phase of this was trying to emulate the social hour, which we did via breakout rooms, which have been a really big success. Uh, at first, people were a little bit hesitant, but once they got going on it, they really got into it. And the training part, I think, also needs to be mentioned that we have a member who's in her 90s and can manage pretty well with all of this. Can't seem quite started on her own, but we've heard from a number of people that they hated it at first and now they love it. Thank you, John. I think that's true. And just very quickly before I turn it over to Susan, I think that that is uh, one of our biggest queries in our meeting right now, even with a hybrid meeting, how to reach out to people who are not comfortable with either Zoom or being there in person, and how do we make connections with them and keep them as a vital part of the meeting. Our meeting small before the pandemic, we would have anywhere from 45 to 65 members for meeting for worship every first day. And since the pandemic, it's dropped down to about 30, which is still good, but we have members that have never participated and, and that's of interest to us. Thank you, Zach. I'll, I'll cut off right now and uh, turn it over to Susan. Thanks, Molly. Take it away, Susan. All right, thank you, Molly. Thank you, Zachary. Um, <clears throat> so Molly has covered a lot of the sort of preliminary, how we all got to here and all the challenges that we are facing. Um, very early on though, Upper Dublin and Byberry, uh, basically through supportive grants and donations, uh, having done a fair bit of research on Facebook, ended up going with the owl. Uh, if you haven't seen this lovely little bird, uh, one of the things that I say to everyone is she loves to fly. So if you want to give her a test, my email will be, I have just a couple quick pictures to show. Um, so if you want to give her a test, I, I'm sorry, because I call her her, um, in part because I'm the one who's driving her around. Um, but if you want to test her out, please get in touch with me, uh, because it really is, the one thing that I say about the owl is, it is definitely not the solution for everyone. Uh, Wendy Kane is actually on this call and, and the owl flew to Wendy. Uh, we did a trial in Newtown meeting and it really wasn't successful. So it is definitely not a one size fits all sort of thing. Uh, so I am just gonna do a couple quick things real quickly. Uh, bear with me one second, just to... Uh, so first question is, do we integrate technology? One of the things that we found is that we do have some friends who are in CCRCs. They don't drive. And so now this has become a huge way of their participating. Doesn't require the, it doesn't require the owl, but it does require technology in our meeting house. Uh, friends have also said that they find that with the owl, sorry, I don't know why that just jumped ahead, sorry. Um, that, their hearing is so much better improved with 
the with the owl. Um, the audio on the owl is phenomenal, and so they're hearing more by by utilizing that technology. Um, also, when weather is an issue, by having technology in the meeting house, people don't have to drive in inclement weather. Funny story about safety, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, as you can, as you saw, this is the owl picture of her. Uh, she is, or it is, just under one foot tall. That mesh that you can see is the speaker as well as the microphone. Uh, weighs two pounds, simple, easy thing just to set up and effectively leave that way. Uh, these are four meetings in Abington Quarter that have invested in the uh, OWL. Oh my gosh. All right, you know, we're not, um, let me just quickly, um, here's an example of four meeting houses. You can see that they are very different in, I'm just gonna stop this. Um, all very different. The big parameters that make a difference are the height of the ceiling. If you've got a big open meeting house, it's going to struggle a little bit more than something like Upper Dublin that has a lower ceiling. It also has partitions that allow you to essentially sequester an area. That helps keep the sound trapped. Carpeting tends to absorb the sound. Wood floor tends to uh, give the microphones a better chance at picking up on the sound. Um, so those are probably the biggest parameters in terms of the physical space. But then you also have the issue of socially distancing. So if you've got a really large congregation, Newtown's much larger than both Byberry and Upper Dublin, which are the two meetings that I spend most of my time in. Um, they're smaller congregations. And because of Zoom and physical limitations, we don't have everyone showing up in the meeting house when we're in person. Uh, so by having a smaller group in the meeting house, we're able to socially distance and still pick up the 18 to 20 foot radius that the owl will uh, hear and see. What we have found is we had to, we essentially had to compromise. Um, funny story, last night I was talking with a friend who had said he'd seen that we were doing this presentation today uh, and said, oh, you know, what are you talking about? And I said, well, really pretty much talking about the owl. And I said, oh, the owl. And my heart sank and immediately started racing. Where is he going with this? What are we going to do? Why does he hate it? He's a teacher in a school. It has not worked in that classroom. What's sort of funny about this, and we've really developed a relationship with OWL Labs, it almost seems as if the OWL was in some ways designed for Quakers. In a classroom where you have sounds coming from all over the place at the same time, the OWL can't quite figure out where to focus. And so it can be that as you watch it, um, try, to, try to figure out where the sound is coming from, the visual isn't great. What we decided is we basically recognize the voices as, as someone sharing vocal ministry. So we decided that the visual was less important than hearing the audio, being able to discern someone's message. And the owl has been just magnificent with that. It does a great job of picking up the sounds and clearly uh, projecting it. So that was one of the compromises that we did have to uh, eff effectively make the decision around. Um, sorry, I hope to do this on slides to show you, but for some reason it was talking. Um, so the considerations that make it a likely success, smaller meeting house, lower ceilings. Uh, one of the issues with Newtown is they have an existing sound system and that made it, uh, we weren't able to hook into it and that made it problematic there. One of a couple other issues. Um, if it's a partitioned meeting house and you can pull up the partitions and still keep socially distanced, 
that helps, again, the sound reverberates off of the wood partitions and helps make it more successful. Um, it does require Wi-Fi effectively. The OWL works as another participant in Zoom. So as we're sitting here, if I had the Zoom on right now, you would see one screen much like the one that I'm in that would just be a participant in Zoom. You can set it so that it will take up the whole screen and not show the other participants and give you a chance to, um, on the bottom, it will give you the full panoramic and on the top, it will focus on the individual who's speaking. Uh, but it is just another participant in Zoom. So it does mean that you do have to have a subscription or be participating. Um, some of the considerations that make it less successful, high ceilings, large meeting house, large congregation, no partitions, uh, and signal strength. If you cannot use a coaxial cable or your Wi-Fi is greatly, or the router is removed from where you will be using it, and you don't have great signal strength, we found that to be a little bit of an issue. Um, so the required components are, you need a laptop, you need the Wi-Fi, either closed signal or coax cable. It does require a cell phone to run the app, um, power in the meeting house to run the laptop, and then the Zoom platform. Um, we did talk about some other options and uh, David Miller, who's on this call at Plymouth, they are one of the ones who uh, did very successfully use the OWL after some trial and error. Um, but what we sort of collectively decided was some of the other options that require mounting cameras throughout the meeting house to capture uh, participants you start adding up the cost of multiple cameras and multiple audio systems, and it can get pretty pricey um, and not necessarily such great quality with some of the trials that we did on other audio options. Um, the OWL is effectively $1,000. Um, the membership development granting group will fund up to 1,000 on the simple um, basic application. I think Zachary said he had the link that uh, we might be able to put up in the chat button for anyone who needs it. Um, but membership development granting group is a great way to get the funds for this. Um, so at $1,000, that's the basic retail price. One thing that I do say, and I will put this up in the chat after we're done, it was on the slide for you. Um, is both my email, byberryquakers at gmail.com. And also I will give you John Heber's contact details at OWL Labs. I do suggest if you're considering the OWL, A, get in touch with me because I'm happy to bring it to you. Uh, I'm in Bucks County and Doylestown. The closer you are, the easier it is to coordinate, but I don't mind traveling further. Um, it, uh, John Heber. Um, if your purchase goes through John, he has agreed that because we've been a great test model for them and been working with them in some of their national uh, sales meetings and things, that they will give us a volume discount. So by going through John, we make sure that we get credit on that dollar cost averaging. Um, so I do recommend you contact me or contact him. Um, and sorry, I feel like I've just rambled <laughs> incessantly there. Um, I think I've covered most everything. Yeah, thank you um, both to Molly and Susan. Um, I really love the stage setting that the both of you have done. Um, we're running slightly behind our intended agenda for today. Um, and so I want to leave some very brief space in case there's any burning questions that people have for Molly or Susan, and then go straight into small groups. So were there any questions that just feel like they need to be asked in this moment? There's a question on the chat that I share as well about how do people in the meeting house, when you're using the OWL, see 
participants at a distance? I mean, have you put up a monitor or multiple monitors or what, what's that about? So we have only used the laptop to date, uh, primarily because uh, we have done a handful of meetings and David can speak to this a little bit better um, from two aspects. One is how to display and also some of the issues that come along with the display issue. Um, but just using our laptop, we actually did an outdoor unplug and recharge and everyone was still able to see the laptop from a distance, uh, even outside and knew who was speaking. But again, because it's we tend to rely more heavily on the audio than the video, um, but it is something that we are discerning going forward. Does that help? Thank you. Zachary, I'm noticing there's another question in the chat. Um, yeah. Like so, a call on. Yeah. So this is one of those things where I'm sure we could spend a lot of time in Q&A right now. And I think that there will be a chance closer to the end of the call for us to have some more all group discussion. But I really would like us to go a little deeper while we're together um, and, and head into small groups for a time. So Olivia, if you could begin the process of breaking people up into small groups and Walter. I, I got here late because I had the wrong link. Um, is, does Molly's configuration, is it written up somewhere? And is there a link to that so that, mm. so that the technical configuration of what she set up can be looked at more closely? I'll put my email in the chat and email me and I can send you some more information just about the logistics of what we did and what worked and what didn't work. That would be very helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. And we are, we had promised that we would record this meeting. So that is happening and we'll post that so folks can um, review what they might have missed um, from the incorrect link that got shared. Apologies to those who were late due to that glitch. Mercury is in retrograde. <laughs> um, and then Zachary, before we go into our breakout spaces, um, I, um, you'll be putting the queries in the chat. And then we also need to make sure that we identify um, in each small group, a facilitator and a note taker. Yes, so here I'm pasting the queries. We wanna take about 10 minutes. Um, and the, there are more queries than can be addressed in 10 minutes. And so my hope is that we'll um, the, when you gather together, the first thing that you'll do is choose among you who is going to be a facilitator and choose among you someone who will be taking notes um, so that the person taking notes can share those with me via email at the conclusion of our meeting and um, they can be included in a follow-up write-up to this that will go out with the recording. Um, so a facilitator and a note taker will stop at 10 minutes and we'll continue our discussion as an all group um, at the stop, um, sort of picking up on where the small groups left off. Welcome back everyone. So I think what's important, what I really wanna emphasize is that this is a preliminary moment for us to begin exploring these issues. So the idea of a hybrid meeting where we bring together virtual uh, participants and in-person participants, I think is something that many of us are still wrapping our heads around about how that could work and how we could support a situation and a mindset moving forward where we meet our needs for accessibility and inclusion while also having substantive and meaningful engagement and those things, how we balance those is a question moving forward. So for the rest of our time, we only have about 15 minutes and I'm sure that you've had some, you've only just begun to get to the rich 
golden nugget of some of these questions in your small groups. And so what I'm really curious for us to bring to the full group now is um, related to the third query, what do we need to do to address what's challenging and embrace what's exciting? And more about, let's name the headlines. Let's focus on what are the issues that we need to address in order to live into that query and navigate the balance between meaningful engagement and accessibility. So what are the, um, maybe not going into the specifics right now because we only have 15 minutes, but what are some headlines of things you discussed that you think as a yearly meeting and as monthly and quarterly meetings, we're gonna need to return to in our work as we go along in the next six months. And, and so I'm inviting that type of input for the rest of our meeting. Um, and curious if folks might have things to say. And Olivia and I will um, help identify folks who have their hands raised and might want to share. Bruce? Actually, John is in our group, so I'm going to have, he was our note taker. Okay. And his hand was up. Okay, uh, well, great. I, I think the people in our group who shared, uh, it was, I'm, I'm going to go with unanimous here. We definitely want to keep this going because of how we can outreach to so many other folks. Keep, keep a, a meeting like this happening. The hybrid meeting. Mm, okay, got it, got it. Were there other things from your group, Bruce, that you wanted to add? I, I might add to that then just to fit two parts. People who had challenges with just what I'll call people issues, like I don't want to be on technology. I don't want to be, you know, hybrid. I don't want to be those things. And then the technical issues of how do you make it work, which are consistent across with everybody in our, in our group. I think that probably is a summation. Um, Dana? Well, in my group, um, there was, we, we had a lot of uh, skepticism about the complexity and cost of doing this, but it was very helpful for me to have the distinction made between going full virtual um, so that, let's say you, you could have two equal sized groups of friends integrated versus thinking about how do we accommodate um, a much smaller number of friends who can't be there in person. And um, so the idea that there might be simpler ways of doing that, um, that would still allow you to make those accommodations. David? Uh, yeah, I was just going to express my gratitude for bringing this group together. Um, I think this is such an important conversation for us to have. I, I as I reflect on it, you know, um, this pandemic has been an incredible opportunity to deepen my worship experience, both within my community and then across with other Quakers. I'm attending the Pendle Hill meeting as an example in the morning and um, it's just so exciting to see so many other Quakers gathered who are working together and uh, Zoom creates this incredible opportunity for us to get to know one another, um, you know, in our communities in ways that just are so powerful. So I, I just want to say thank you, Zachary, and I hope we can do more of this because <clears throat> I see this as a vehicle for expanding um, Quakerism, expanding and deepening Quakerism. Um, into the future, uh, it's a, a an accidental benefit of this tr very trying time. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think we're finding silver linings everywhere. Um, Molly? Yes, I think our group kind of hit the nail on the head uh, at the starting gate saying that the one of the more important things is not the technology because a lot of us are kind of tech heads, but how to engage people spiritually and socially and keep that momentum going with community in our meeting. And that's where we found we ran out of time because we all had so much to say to each other about this issue that we 
I, I couldn't agree more. We need more of this. We need more interaction to be able to, to talk to each other and share ideas and, and, and uh, learn from each other. So thank you. Thanks, Molly. Deb? Um, I would just add, it's, um, I serve as coordinator for Western Quarter. We have some small, very rural meetings that don't have electricity. Um, and so their form of connecting and ha uh, really having their worship time together is to phone each other. Um, you know, across the quarter, um, and as I think about um, things shared from this morning, there are significant numbers still attending meeting for worship, attending the social events within our meeting. We've picked up some people from, you know, who have moved away and live across the country, across the world, but there's still a sizable portion anywhere from a quarter to a third who we are not seeing either in person or via Zoom. Um, and, you know, my concern in both in my meeting and across Western Quarter is how are we making that group, um, how are we staying connected and aware of the needs um, and issues and challenges and daily realities, the spiritual life of, of those people that we haven't been able um, to see in person or via Zoom. Thank you, Deb. Charles, and I also see Tom. Yeah, Richard. just very quickly, you know, in, 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 in the breakout room, uh, we were, um, I, I was focusing technically, but right, what we have, um, sort of lost touch. I mean, not not total touch, but not able to be at worship. Um, a couple of young families with uh, small children that uh, just, you know, trying to be. Uh, there's no first day school for the children to be in while they worship at, at this point, and so they they have um, kind of dropped out. And uh, while we keep in touch, it's they're lost. And the oldest members, two of them, are just not technically interested in trying to do it or to be out. So losing those those both those ends has been has been a loss for our meeting, despite other things that have been good. Thank you, Charles. Tom, did you want to raise something? Yes, our pastoral care committee has done an enormous amount in the past year, sending cards, calling people, occasionally visiting people at a social distance, uh, taking meals to people. And I think in addition to the Zoom for meeting for worship and committees, which we've done very extensively, uh, there's just a lot of personal outreach going on within the meeting community, both from pastoral care, but just looking after one another. And I think that's really been enormously helpful. Uh, we're not reaching everybody successfully, I think, but uh, we're certainly trying. Thank you, Tom. John? And to follow up on that, uh, I started a, I was going to call it a happy hour, decided happier was all I could offer uh, <laughs> for uh, Friday evenings and to just hang out. And uh, that, that's been very helpful as well. I see a chat comment here um, from D. Wayne. And also from Melinda. Melinda, do you want to verbalize some of what you've shared in the chat? Sure. Um, if friends don't know me, I'm Melinda Wenner Bradley, and I'm the Youth Religious Life Coordinator for the Early Meeting. Um, what's always on my heart in these conversations are those families, um, people who are parents and worship with us and who we may not have seen, um, and our children and young people. Um, many of whom we know are zoomed out and so a program on a Sunday morning is difficult for them. Um, I, I've written some, it's on the PYM website about trying to stay tethered to our families, connected to them with these challenges, uh, ways we might think about um, creating um, program and community and I would lift up that it's in the chat um, once a month, PYM hosts on the fourth Sunday, a giant children's meeting. So like giant first day school, it's open for um, anyone in the sort of up to fifth grade group and their families. Um, I think there's something like 32 meetings have families or folks register for it right now. 
Um, it's a half hour, 45 minute program, and it's really meant to be there if you are not having a program for children and young people. Um, and it's at nine on purpose so that parents could go to worship later at, at the time that their meeting has worship. Um, but it is really kind of holding that space. And we've just added a youth led meeting for worship once a month um, on, at, from 8 to 8.30 p.m. for middle and high school, um, which is a youth centered just half hour of meeting for worship again. I know my teenagers are not as happy about getting up to go to worship on Zoom with us at 10 in the morning on Sundays. So this is their own space. Um, so those things are on the, um, the website and I'm really happy to be in relationship with meetings as well to think about how to, to be supporting families and young people. Do you wanna put your email in the chat, Melinda? So, We'll be collecting everything that is being shared in the chat and what has been discussed in this recording. Um, so we have some something in writing that we can share with people in addition to posting this. Um, and I really love to know um, who is not in this meeting, but if there are people here or that you know of who might be willing to provide some more advice or experience to people in monthly meetings who might be even less far along in this than we are here, um, please reach out, send me an email um, and we'll, we'll make sure um, that we stay in touch with you. Because I think one of the things that we'll need to do in addition to continuing to have these types of conversations is do everything we can to facilitate um, this mutual support as we navigate together um, the new reality that we have. Um, so were there any final um, sharing that anyone wanted to have, Rick? Yeah, I, I want to ask about the transcript that's going on. Who who and how is that happening? There's, Each. there's a, people are able to read what's going on at the bottom of the chat. And we had some question at Lehigh Valley whether that's something that would be uh, available. And how did, how did that happen? TJ, do you want to talk to, about that? Sure. Um, it's a resource through rev.com. Um, it's a seven day free trial. We're just testing it out to see if it's worthwhile getting. Uh, it's automated. It, there's not a person behind it. It's just a robot sort of um, taking speech to text uh, uh, automatically. Um, but I think the regular price is something like $20 a month. Well, great, thank you. Anything else, Walter? Um, I just would like to uh, remind myself and others to stay grounded in the spirit and in the connection of community and maybe go technical and maybe not go technical. But the big learnings I think of the pandemic have been to really step up our game in being in relationship with each other. And to me, that's the most important thing. Uh, Zach, you mentioned that this was being recorded. Uh, is, will that be uh, available? Yes, we'll, we'll post it and share it with people. Thanks. Okay, Susan? I can just quickly add, uh, there was something that came out from PYM last week about the program, I think through Temple, making technology um, uh, laptops and or Chromebooks available. And I just wanted to let everyone know, look into that if you have issues with accessibility for people who can't get into the technology. And that's the link that I just posted. Okay, one, one last comment from Bob. Did you have your hand raised? I will, Jack already asked the question. I want to make sure uh, since I and a few others arrived late I was wondering whether how we can see the whole discussion that we missed and the, uh, what was displayed or shared. 
<clears throat> I mean, uh, uh, pronounced. Great. So we'll share that. Um, we'll share that out with everyone who attended and also posted on the website with the notes. Um, and I want to, I think it, I, I really resonated with Walter, with Walter sharing about um, remaining in, staying in touch with our centers and the spirit and um, each other in relationship through these times and taking that as the one of the core or essential lessons. Um, so with that, why don't we close with a brief moment of worship together. Thanks so much, friends. We're gonna close the meeting now. It's been so great to gather with all of you for this hour. Thanks to Susan and Molly for your presentations. And we'll be back in touch very soon. <laughs>